Hi, I'm Bessie, I'm the founder of Modern Nature, and today we're going to talk about the food industry, product development, healthy living, and stevia. Hello, welcome to Profile Tree TV. I'm Michelle Connolly, and today we are with Bessie Rowlands of Modern Nature, and we're going to be hearing all about her company. So, Bessie, lovely to have you here today. I'm just going to let you introduce yourself to everyone and tell us a little bit about what you do and what your company does. Sure. So, as you said, my name's Bessie and I'm the founder of Modern Nature. So, Modern Nature make low sugar, sugar free, and reduced sugar. There is a difference between the three uh, consumables. So, we mainly at the moment concentrate, we have a um, liquid stevia sweetener. So, we're concentrating kind of in the sweetener syrup section at the moment. Okay. So we have a liquid stevia sweetener, and then we have, um, at the moment, sugar-free coffee syrups as well. We're soon to be launching a new uh, granulated stevia sweetener, and uh, we're working on um, a range of hot chocolates uh, that will be coming in the next year or so. So we're working on a lot, and we're kind of gradually gradually taking over the food industry one product at a time. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. You've, you've it well thought out. And just how did you come to develop this idea? Mm -hmm. what, what was the sort of background behind it? Well, the background was really my health. So um, my health story is a very long story, and I won't <laughs> bore you with the whole thing. Uh, but in essence, I have a genetic blood condition that makes me more likely to develop diabetes. And um, I started to become unwell with my blood condition at 17, but I wasn't diagnosed until 22. Wow. So in that time, I actually developed pre-diabetes um, and quite severe IBS, which are, um, with the blood condition, there's some of the things that you're, you're likely to develop. Um, so that's how I got interested in health and healthy eating and um, healthy living. Um, so it was just the main thing that I, my kind of main ambition was just to reverse my pre-diabetes and my IBS, which I've now done. And um, I use Stevia to help, you know, as a tool yes, to, of course. to do that. Um, and yeah, so that's how I discovered Stevia and um, how, you know, how, what a good um, option it was, you know, what a good alternative to sugar. Um, and I can come on to why in particular later, but yes, in, when I was struggling with um, going sugar free, my physician said, you know, try stevia, yeah. and that's how I and that's how I um, started using it. And I just thought, you know, it's so, at the time it was incredibly expensive. You know, I'm talking fifteen, sixteen pounds for a tiny little bottle. That's amazing. It's like really expensive yeah. um, and really hard to get hold of. Um, so I just sort of set about. You know, one day I was like, right, <laughs> I'm going to do this myself <laughs> and make it more accessible to um, into, to the UK market. Um, the, at the time, there just was no real Stevia options. Um, and there's still now is, apart from modern nature, <laughs> um, it's still now you, to get kind of pure Stevia is quite tricky. That's really interesting because we hear about all these artificial sweeteners and mm -hmm. sugar-free on the market mm -hmm. and, and obviously they're something that completely different to what you're creating. Yeah, so so artificial sweeteners are completely different to stevia. The only thing they have in common is that they are sweet. Um, but artificial sweeteners were um, developed, I, I think, in the 40s. I can't remember the exact decade, but it was a num number of decades ago. Um, and... Um, kind of came to came to market, you know, uh, late I think in the fifties. I think that's when Diet Coke launched. I might be I might be making that that up, but it was either the forties or fifties. Anyway, um, and whereas stevia is a plant, um, and so it's naturally sweet. Yes. So I suppose it kind of leads on to where does stevia come from? Um, so artificial sweeteners are, are chemicals that are man-made, whereas stevia is a herb that grows naturally. Um, and stevia is native to Paraguay and South America. And stevia actually grows naturally right up to, like throughout South America and right up to Texas. Um, and yeah, so stevia has been used by the indigenous people by, of Paraguay for over 1500 years. You know, it can actually be, considerably longer than that. And um, I was actually um, watching an interview with a stevia specialist who was saying, you know, it could have actually been consumed by humans for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so that's the main 
I see the main difference is that it has actually been consumed by humans for a, a really, really long yeah, time. That's amazing. And yeah. it's good to see that difference because, you know, you're bombarded in the media about all these different things and mm. what you should be eating, what you shouldn't be eating. And it's amazing to see that actually most people probably don't know the difference between... They don't, yeah. And I think with stevia as well, because with labelling, um, the way that we legally have to label stevia is sweetener, then um, colon, then... Um, steviol glycosides, which is its kind of scientific name, and then brackets stevia leaf extract. So it takes up quite a lot of space on the label, and um, that that we have to label it that way. Um, so I think people do. I know I've had some emails being like, "Well, why uh, why is stevia labelled as a sweetener?" I was like, "Well, that's that's it is natural, but it is technically a sweetener because it is used to sweeten um, sweeten you know whatever it is. So it does." I think that labelling does confuse customers, for sure. Yeah, and I think, too, back to that whole idea of, you know, being safe and mm. all these information about sweeteners maybe aren't as safe and people say maybe you're just better taking natural sugar. I know there's a lot in the media around, you know, sweeteners and sugar alternatives. Stevia, in terms of safety, how mm -hmm. safe is it as, a, as an alternative to sugar? Whilst it's a new ingredient in the UK and the US, um, stevia has actually been, it's been really well integrated into the Japanese food industry. So if you go to a supermarket in Japan, many of the, of the um, food products there will contain stevia. And Japanese are always, they're consistently coming out as you know, the healthiest nation um, and, you know, cause, and much lower levels of obesity and diabetes than, than countries in Europe That's or in crazy, the States. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, um, so I think, I think because people are only just starting to hear about it in the in the Europe and the US there's, there's an idea that it's oh it's something new and it's unknown and, and it's it is something that is very much being consumed by humans for a long time um, very very well studied for it to be a um, to go through that process where it can be approved as a sweetener it has to go through a really rigorous um, uh, uh, research um, and testing program to be approved and um, there, there are quite a lot of, I mean, a lot of the studies that have been done, you can actually go and, and read online. And I would, I would really recommend that people go and do that um, to, so that they have an understanding of, of, um, of stevia if they, if they do have questions about it. But there is one um, that I came across a while ago that I really like because it's really simple. It's been done, it's a um, human study and it was, and it's kind of a more of an observation. Um, so I'm just going to, summarize the yeah, study. Of course, yeah. So 486 first year students uh, belonging to four Chilean universities were evaluated. So this was a study done in South America and Chile um, uh, observing nearly 500 students. Um, so each student completed a weekly food frequency questionnaire including food and beverages containing stevia. So they um, completed food a food diary and um, uh, it was calculated how much stevia each person was consuming okay. based on what they were they were eating. Uh, stevia has been available, has been used in the South American food industry for a long time as well. So um, it's it, it would be quite common to find stevia in, in food products. Um, so 69.8% of the students consumed stevia every week. The liquid form being the main contributor to the dietary stevia intake. So that's um, our liquid stevia yes, sweetener. Of course, it would yes. be, so 81.2% of stevia that they consumed was the same format as what we make. Only 1.4% of students went over the acceptable daily intake. So of the students studied, only 1.4% of them went over their recommended allowance of calories, okay, right? Interesting. So considering 70% of the people are consuming stevia regularly, a tiny, tiny minority are eating over the um, the limit that the limit was set, yeah. That that is recommended. So that indicates that stevia isn't increasing their appetite. Which um, the some of the questions is well, are, if you're eating sweetness, do you then crave sweetness? And so this is showing that that's not true, and that's been my experience and what I would, you know, what studies yes. show. It, that's very consistent with what studies show. Um, so the other very interesting thing was. Normal weight women show a higher stevia intake compared to those obese or overweight. So finally, it's the final kind of conclusion of the study was stevia consumption appears to be positively associated with normal weight um, in, in the students. So basically what it's saying is that um, 
that m the vast majority of the people that were taking part in the study were eating stevia regularly. It, it wasn't contributing to them overeating, and it and the more stevia that the um, more stevia that uh, participant was consuming, the more likely they were to be normal weight. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's um, that's because I really like that because it's real life. You yes. know, it's not done in a lab, and so um, it's. It's, it's what's actually happening. Um, and yeah, so I think that's one of my favorite studies because it just, it's simple and it's, and it's taken from, from real life. Yeah, it's so interesting. As I mentioned, I used to be pre-diabetic and what I really noticed when I, compared to how I am now, because my blood sugar is now a completely normal level, I don't have blood sugar issues anymore. Um, when I was pre-diabetic, I would crave sugar all the time. I would, I, I would like fantasize about ice cream and things. And um, so what happens when, when you have blood sugar issues, you've, your blood sugar is elevated and so you crave sugar. You eat sugar, then you have a crash. Then you crave sugar, you eat sugar, you have a crash. You crave sugar, you eat sugar, you have a crash. And that's where this, that up and, dying up comes. and down, you get you know, the um, inconsistent energy levels and um, food cravings come from. So with Stevia, what I've um, noticed for myself is you crave sugar, you have stevia, you satisfied your sweet tooth, but your blood sugar doesn't change. So then you're craving sugar less. And so you, you're not getting, so your blood sugar ends up being more consistent. You, know, you crave sugar, you have stevia, your blood sugar is consistent. You might, you enjoy sweetness, so you have some more stevia, your blood sugar is consistent. And so it, it prevents, it prevents that. And probably that immense craving that yes you might want to be a bit of sugar now and again but you you're not feeling I like the need to really I don't eat it feel the need to yeah. to and I this is I think um this is the thing with um I don't think that the public are given all the information around obesity and diabetes and um what what you would expect to experience and how difficult it is to overcome these things I know how difficult it was to overcome pre-diabetes and that's not even full-on type 2 diabetes yeah. um and that's you know, it's, it annoys me when um, nutritionists and health experts going to get on their high horse and preach an unrealistic approach. Yeah, it has to be realistic it has because to be otherwise realistic. people just give up. Yeah, and you know, Steve is not going to be for everyone, but if you're someone that really craves sweetness and really, you know, you really like a sweet coffee or you, you know, you just can't go without that kind of, that sweetness, Stevia is a really, really great option to just, you know, to try and if, um, you know, as, and it, as I say, it's not going, it doesn't impact your blood sugar levels. So you, you aren't going to get the same negative effects that you get with, um, with sugar. I suppose you have to weigh that up as well. Um, you know, we are, it was on the news last week um, that one in four children in Northern Ireland are suffering from obesity and overweight and all of that. And it's all, it's all very Just, scary. But I'm thinking, you know, even if you could reduce the sugar intake by 30%, that's actually massive. I'm going to cause a massive impact which again I know it's the expense but the expense of the healthcare system is is probably even more yeah I mean the the biggest challenge is that because um stevia has been um whilst it's been consumed by humans for a long time it has been introduced to the European and US food industry relatively recently um that I've I Companies, uh, I have helped companies develop products using Stevia and there is a lack of knowledge around it, around how it works, um, uh, not how it works, but how to incorporate yes, Stevia and, and, and replace the sugar, um, or at least some of it. So um, that I think is a big um, barrier. It's just that there aren't actually that many people that know how to formulate products using Stevia. Um, so it will it was i think it would take a lot of time and um to get to the point where 20 percent of sugar is just gone yes. um but it it is achievable yeah and, and it is something that really does need to be explored as an option because mm. we're seeing the health system is suffering with children that aren't maybe exercising as much as they used sure, to yeah. you know the sugar's there diets have changed people can afford sugary treats and well, things more yeah. than they used to be able to do you know what and, and that's a really interesting point you're saying that people can afford it because um i 
um, you know, life is difficult. You know, everyone's life is difficult. No matter how rich or poor, no matter what your size, no matter what your age, life is hard. And people, I think, do um, rely on crutches to kind of get through how difficult life is. And before it would have been, you know, drugs have been around of course. for ages, you know. Um, and that's where Coca-Cola came from. Co Coca-Cola contained course, cocaine yeah. and that was to, it was developed and sold in pharmacies to help um, soldiers come off morphine. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, that, so coking in Coca-Cola was affordable back then, but, you know, lots of food wasn't. Whereas now, you know, cigarettes are incredibly expensive, alcohol is incredibly exp expensive, but food is still affordable. Yeah. And I think, and I do believe that a lot of people rely on food as a bit of a, a crutch to, to, you know, because life is hard and it's stressful. Yeah. And we have the whole convenience route as well, where yeah, it's actually it's just easy everywhere. just to grab, you know, a bar of chocolate easier than probably grabbing an apple or, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, less, I think definitely less so now. It is definitely, and I've noticed, like, when I was unwell and um, I had to completely come off and eliminate all sugar from my um, lifestyle. And I mean, not just cane sugar, but I mean, I was off fruit, I was off syrups and things like that. And so I remember it being incredibly difficult, but now, you know, that's only about, I don't know how many years is that? You know, between five and 10 years, it has gotten much better. In the last, I was in the last two years, it's much, much easier to have a busy lifestyle and stick to, uh, I think the RDA at the moment is the recommended daily allowance is 30 grams, I think, yeah. for an adult. Yeah, and I think too, people are more aware that there are other options out there and that they have to be careful with their health and, and you know, there's more education around it as well, yeah. which is great. But I'm going to take a wee step back if sure. you don't mind <laughs> and just talk about, so you had the idea mm -hmm. and you decided that you were going to make the product. So talk us through that journey because that's a, that's a big and that's a really difficult uh, journey. And I think I too, there's a lot of small businesses that have probably a product idea and it's yeah. getting that idea from to concept market. to uh, that I've got this idea to what, how do I go through that process to actually develop it into something to have a living, breathing product? Yeah, it no takes pressure. a while. It takes, and I'm like, do you know what? I, um, there's a Blue Peter presenter, and I can't remember her name, but she has a really good saying, and um, it's that you just have to eat the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> Not that we want to eat any elephants, but um, I think it's quite a good, um, you know, metaphor. There are say there are a thousand steps to take from having an idea to the point that your uh, product is available for sale you just have to take each step and you know there aren't any shortcuts and it is hard and you will make mistakes but you just have to take steps and eventually you'll get there which doesn't yeah. sound very optimistic but there we go no, but you're right it is taking it it's not jumping in with both feet and just thinking that you can develop a product you've got the idea and, and within a month you'll have a product sitting there in front of you and in terms of sourcing like mm -hmm. the stevia and what what sort of process did you have to go through with that do you know what sourcing stevia was the easiest part of this whole process <laughs> um uh, we we buy from a very reliable supplier, so they um, they uh, manage the farms. It's harvested by them, and then they they it goes through the process of of um, the extraction process. So we are lucky that we have a reliable source, and it's very consistent. The price is very consistent at the moment. Um, so that wasn't the problem, um, and even developing the recipe, the first recipe. I mean, our recipe now that we use for our original liquid stevia is slightly different to what we originally started with. But even that, um, it wasn't that difficult. Coming up with the recipe is quite straightforward. It's then, it, then testing it takes quite a long time because yes. it has to go through shelf life. And I like to do um, actual, um, rather than doing accelerated shelf life testing, I like to do proper, um, you, know, you, you make a sample and you leave it there for 18 months to see what happens. <laughs> um, and... Um, I prefer to do that. So that just takes a long time. And also packaging. Our bottle is custom. It's bespoke, it was a bespoke design. Um, so we had to get a tooling made, a big metal tool made to pop these things out. And then I suppose you're then having to buy in quantity in order to do yes. that. Well, that's not, I mean, actually, um, what I would say with, with packaging is that you do need to buy in quantity, but I do prefer to buy smaller amounts and pay more, more up front because we've had an issue we've had an issue um, a couple of times where we've bought loads of labels 
and then when I off it, well actually we're gonna change the ingredients slightly so we can't use them. So I've really, really learned to take it one, we just, we just, with the first run, we take the cost on the chin because I'm not prepared to fork out for like 50,000 units. I once was, I'm not anymore. You've <laughs> learned to re-experience. I've learned to experience <laughs> Don't fork out for stock that you don't need. Pay more for a smaller amount and get it right and make sure that you're happy with it. And then, um, you know, just accept you might have to break even on that first run or might have to make a small loss, but you've, you're in, in the long run, you're better off because you're actually spending less. And if you're buying 50,000 labels, but then you can only use a thousand because after the first run, yeah, there's no point in actually having them and you've outlaid a massive cost probably and for stuff that you don't even need. Yeah, and then there's a huge, and the, the other thing is how do you dispose of stock? Because often disposing of stock that you don't need costs money in and of itself. So that's another thing that people don't necessarily bear in, in mind. Like, so like, uh, whenever, we, whenever we come to the end of a batch, so we do a batch and then we, have, we make that available for however many months and then uh, what, whatever's left over, we typically use for promotional purposes. That, so we'll um, either give products to subscription boxes or we send them out to um, like, you know, marathons and things. Yes, of course, bags. yes. So though people aren't necessarily paying for an individual item, but that still costs money for us to do. It's shipping. Of course, um, yeah. You know, they'll typically take a small fee. So that's the other thing. You don't want stock left over. It, it's a nightmare to dispose of, no matter what it is. Um, and it costs, it co will cost you money to dispose of it. Giving it away for free off sometimes isn't even an option. Which is really interesting because you'd think, you think once oh, you just give who, away, yeah, yeah, people want a free product. But if you've got, um, you know, say if you're doing around 50,000 units, right? And then you've got 5,000 left over. So that's only 10%. You've sold 90% great. But getting over 5,000 units isn't easy. When you're dealing with a food product, obviously there's a lot of regulations that you may have to go through. Yeah. Is that a difficult process? Um, not really. I think um, our products are very simple and we try and use as few ingredients as possible. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the food is, is, it's quite, it's more straightforward than you think because ingredients will only be for sale if they are approved for use in food. So as long as you're buying from an accredited um, supplier and um, with ingredients, you know, there aren't actually that many um, you, there, are, there aren't that many really big players that can source a huge variety of ingredients. So we, we only have a few suppliers that we manage to get everything okay. from. And then, so when I develop a product, I get some samples, I get some spec sheets and data sheets and all of that. And so whenever we do a production run, we just have to, we get an ingredient, you know, one of the stock, and then we keep the, the safety sheets and we keep those on file forever. And yeah, so we only have a few ingredients for each product. So the key is don't use too many ingredients. Don't use too many ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> and so what would you say your biggest challenge was from concept to having that product in oh, your packaging. hands? Packaging. Packaging. <laughs> yeah, every time. It's really interesting. And you're currently innovating, or constantly innovating, mm -hmm. and you have to, especially do, in the market yeah. you're in. Um, so you're looking at new products as All we All the speak. time, yeah. At, at any given time, I'm at the moment I'm working on I'm working on four ranges at the moment. So extending an existing range, oh, actually no, yeah, extending the existing range, um, replacing a current range, and then developing two completely new ranges. So, but that will come out over the next, um, I really like to get a new range out. We've only really got two ranges out, so I'm, I'm saying like we do this all the time, but my ambition is to have a new range every year. Um, so, yeah, at any given time, you do have to be working on quite a few. But some of that, you know, out of that four, we might not, we might not launch all yeah. of them. But we, you have to go through the process to see is this a viable product, um, and you do have to go quite far along the process to find out if it is or isn't a viable product. And in my opinion, the best way to find out if something is viable is make it and sell it and see if people buy it and get your feedback. There's, there's no. We've, we've done so much consumer research, and consumer testing, and the most effective thing is just to try and sell it. Yeah. It's to, you know, obviously with food, we ha and it's, it's kind of frustrating with food because you obviously have to follow the regulations and make it safe, which is, it's not difficult to do, but you do have to go through that process. So I can spend two years developing something, and then we find out actually, you know, it's not selling as well as we thought it would, or actually we, we didn't consider this or that. Um, so... 
Yes. But I mean, um, in the startup community, there's a there's a book, The Lean Startup, that most accelerator programs preach. And it is about just creating a minimum viable product as soon as possible. And I hate to say it, but they're right. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's, you know, it's good to know as well that yes, we could be, we're innovating and we're thinking of new ideas, but that sometimes those ideas don't work out and that's okay. And yeah. actually listen to your customers and take their feedback on board and don't just keep on flogging a dead horse, I suppose, as they say, just because you think it's a really good idea. You need to take that customer feedback and look at your sales and look at your, yeah. you know, your data. But yeah, I mean, like with our, so with our current products, so we've got our liquid stevia, which sells really well. And then we've got our um, sugar-free, they're completely, sh well, um, yeah, it's, oh, how many, I think, 0 0.3 of a calorie per serving. So incredibly, it is technically, um, uh, because of that, we can uh, call it calorie-free and or zero calorie, zero sugar. And when when I, I always talk about a lot of a lot of companies are really secretive about what they do, yes. which I think is a really bad thing. I think you should be talking to as many different people and as many potential customers as possible to kind of gauge um how people are reacting. When I first set up Modern Nature and I was like, oh I'm gonna make a liquid stevia sweetener and and telling people about it, they looked at me like and and then and so I was really concerned who flip, you know, is there a market for it? Are people gonna get it? Um, are people gonna are gonna pay a premium for it? Because it is it is a premium product and it costs us quite a lot to make. Um, and the answer is yes, you know, we've made that into a successful product. And with the syrups, you know, um, we um, I mean I design the syrups mainly for food service and we are still pursuing that that route and I think it will be a success in food service. But when I, so I would talk to people like, oh my goodness, I love coffee syrups, I use them all the time, and I think doing a calorie-free, sugar-free one would be great. And then we put it on the market and it doesn't sell as well. You know, it's really interesting to see what people think they want and what people actually buy. It's two very different things. What people think, what people they say they want and what people actually, actually want are two And that's so things. interesting. I mean, we, yeah. would, we would even see that as well. And we would say that quite a lot. You know, people don't know what they don't want until they see what they don't want. And it's very difficult when you're trying to produce a product yeah. or... But things like with our syrup, it's, you know, um, I know they'll be successful with food service, but for some reason, um, people um, people are more inclined to buy sweeteners than they are to buy coffee syrups, even though sweeteners are used in coffee. So um, we're kind of, that's why we're kind of looking at, at um, redoing that that. And that's really interesting avenue. as well, having that avenue and knowing that you have a product that people do actually want, but just switching the market, changing it slightly to fit your consumer and, and what you want. As you say, people possibly don't buy coffee syrups for home, but yeah. they're happy to buy them in a coffee shop. And or they're happy to pay to 80 pitch. You know, the markup that, that coffee shops make on those syrups is bonkers, the markup. And um, so people aren't prepared to spend you know the three pounds or whatever it is. Um, you know, Mona's three pounds, so I'm just using that as an example. They're not necessarily prepared to pay three pounds, and in that three pounds, you know, 50 servings, but they're prepared to pay 80p for one serving in a coffee shop. It's it's really, oh, Flip, do you know what actually we did? Um, it makes me laugh. So, um, Belfast Metropolitan College contacted me, you know, they had some business students that, that needed to do a, uh, some research for a local business. So I was like, great. <laughs> and they researched our syrups. Um, so they did a survey where they asked people if they drank coffee, obviously most people do, and if you drink coffee, you drink it every day. Um, and then um, they uh, asked them where they bought their coffee from if it was out of the house. And most people said um, Costa Coffee. And I think it was Costa Coffee than McDonald's. Um, and then they asked how much you prepare to spend on your cup of coffee. And the most popular answer, so I think like 70% of people shopped at uh, Costa Coffee or something. Most people said, in the same proportion, said a £1.50 a cup. But they were the individuals going to Costa, where you can't get a coffee for less than like £3.50. So it was, I was like, flip, people are not, they're not even aware of how much they're actually spending on yeah. something that they're buying every single day. But they have this mindset that they're only spending a point at a time, <laughs> but they're really not. They're really not. So um, I found that quite amusing. Um, the, yeah, that, that um, consumers aren't necessarily aware of their own habits. I find consumer behavior really interesting. 
yeah, and obviously it's very key in, in what you're doing. So, um, Bessie, this is really interesting in terms of partnerships as well. So you've said that you worked with the Ulster University and that you worked with Belfast Met as well. And yeah. um, would you find partnerships are the way forward in terms of what sort of business that you run and, and the company that you run? I think it depends. I think it really depends. I think, um, you know, we're on a budget, quite frankly. Yes. We can't afford to spend a huge amount on um, on big studies and I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that spending that kind of money is is necessarily worth it you know in terms of consumer research of course um you know actually it's probably just cheaper to make a minimum viable product and and get it out to the market than it is to un, and quicker than it is to undergo a, an enormous consumer insight study um but you know if a, if a university or a college is going to come to you and do that for free and it's going to benefit students and students are going to get um good experience, then it, it is a win-win situation. Um, so we have worked with the Belfast Metropolitan College a couple of times, and then Ulster University actually did the original development work around our recipes, as I said. Um, they, um, when, because with our, my first, our first product, um, our liquid stevia sweetener, they helped me develop it. In terms of, you know, I had some basic recipes that I'd put together, and then they just tested it. We did, I did blind taste testing, we then did blind taste testing with, public then we did the recipe testing so they, they really put that product for its paces and they also did focus group around the branding so we got really good insight at really good value um that we wouldn't you know we wouldn't have been able to get it at that price anywhere else yeah. and it's good to have that support and that experience and that expertise yeah. as well yeah because they have i mean um particularly at Ulster university they have um you know, the people that were running that those studies for us and that research um, have a lot of experience. Um, so at the time when I didn't, they were there to provide guidance. Whereas now I do have experience, you know, quite a lot of experience getting products actually to market. And um, I can, you know, I've learned from from that process, and now I can do that myself. Um, and we might, you know, we do, you know, we might do public blind taste testing that I can't, I can't really do that well um, myself. You know, we can get really good data at, at an affordable price That's brilliant and you mentioned the accelerator programs and things yeah. so there is a lot of free support out there for business startups and uh, this is a uh, there seems to be a lot and I, I the, the the feelings I get from small businesses and startups is that there's a lot out there but you have to be very careful about where you place your time because you know usually when you're starting out time's precious you're maybe only yourself or one other person and you know you can't be going to every networking and every training and every support you have to be really really careful and and choosing where you're going to invest your time yes do i think it's essential no i think you can do it on your own um if you if there aren't any accelerator programs or um startup groups near you it's not the end of the world you'll be fine <laughs> if you can't if you can't get the motivation to do it without that, you're probably not going to make it. Yeah. Um, it's a nice extra, but you know, with accelerator programs, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, typically, I mean, I was on, um, I was, I've done a couple of accelerator programs, and um, if you're getting something like money or free office space, there is, um, you, you know, whilst you're not paying for it in money you are paying for it in other ways because there's often mandatory things that you have to go along with that that might not suit you. So I would um, I would just make sure that you know what's involved if you are getting something for, for free um, and then really think about whether that is worth it for you. Um, you know, like we with one accelerator program, we had free office space. But actually, I... I you know, but it, it made more sense for me just to work at home. You know, it just, yeah. it stopped. I was like, well, you know, I, I wouldn't pay for this. So why am I, why am I giving up my time for it? And I suppose it's, it's that, it's um, making that call yeah. um, for your business and everybody's different. Some people really might need that environment where they need a community around them or yep. you know, they need to bounce ideas off. But I suppose it's it's about being realistic about what suits you and, yeah. and being sensible with your time because you could be running... There's so much support out there. You could be running to training and networking every day. Yeah. But then it holds you back in, in your business and what you're actually supposed to be Doing, setting out to do. Yeah. Well, this is it. And I'm, I've, so in the last few years, I've become much more ruthless with how I spend my time because I just noticed, 
you know, I don't like making commitments that I can't uphold and I don't like feeling like I don't have enough time. So for example, around production time, do it when we do one, even just one production or, you know, two or three productions in a row, that actually takes up three months. It takes up six weeks either side because it's six weeks where I have to manage all the stock and make sure it gets her on time and then make sure they have everything, the, our co-packs have everything they need and they're happy with what they're doing. And then it never run. We've never, ever, ever had a production run come out on time, ever. Right. And that's <laughs> something that, again, you have to just be aware of and build into your timings. Yep. So I just do not do anything. <laughs> Six weeks, you know, I'll, I'll go out for dinner with friends and things, but I don't make any serious commitments because I have to... Be, I have to be available to deal with a crisis. I mean, not a crisis, but by crisis, I mean stock not arriving on time, stock arriving that we didn't order, um, production running over, over, you know, and then uh, typically production runs over and then we get orders. And we don't want to fulfill it with current stock, with the small amount of current stock we have, because that might be a late date on it and we want to provide fresh stock. So, um, you know, we had, oh, flip, we had the biggest hoo-ha with our um, packaging we had to last minute completely redevelop our outer packaging because our um, suppliers just became very, very difficult. Just uh, all of a sudden they, they became incredibly difficult and they wanted more money and up front. Um, and I just was like, Do you know what? No, nope. <laughs> I'm not doing that. So we had to come up with a completely new solution. Sometimes you do have to just say no, enough is enough. I, we have yeah. to think of a different solution here. Well, and that's part of being a business owner too, isn't it? Yeah, do you know what? And you have to make really tough calls, like with the packaging, and that was a really tough call because I've been really badly burnt where we've gone with packaging companies that, um, you know, I've been recommended packaging companies that turned out to be useless, you know, providing us with stock that was not up to scratch and was, and was so expensive. And this is the other thing I would say with packaging, price doesn't equal quality. Um, you know, the solution that we've got at the moment is has is our most affordable solution that we've ever come up with for packaging, but actually it looks really really good. But we just came up with a really simple solution to our outer packaging. So obviously we've got the bottle, but then we have to put something around it. Uh, we can't we can't just ship it um, we can't just ship it in the bottle for various reasons. Um, so yeah, sometimes um, you're pushed down. Th the pushing, you know, push down, you know, kicking and screaming the right route and you just have to make a tough call and, and um, I'm actually really glad that our packaging company now was very difficult because it forced me to think of a solution that was better than what we had. You know, I'm much happier with our packaging now. It's a third of the cost and, um, and it easier to produce. And so you seem to be able to trust and work together, which is a big, a big, big stress off your shoulders, especially during production time, yeah. when you've everything else to be thinking of, never mind yeah. just packaging as well. And interestingly enough, so where do you sell your products then? So our main customer is Ocado, um, which is an online, exclusively online yeah. supermarket in um, the mainland, um, on the mainland. Um, and then uh, Amazon, uh, UK. So we are exploring international Amazon outlets. Um, so there are our main customers and obviously on our own shop. We have an eBay shop. Um, we have our own website as well. Um, so that's that's who our customers are at the moment. Um, but we are exploring, um, you know, obviously we, we do want to get into the multiples yes. and we um, do want to get into a food service outlet. So um, we've got, we have got a long way to go into in terms of getting to the point of, of significant turnover. Um, you know, that, that is, there is still work to do there, but I think we've, the be the benefit of places like Amazon and Ocado, um, I really, really love Ocado as a customer. They're, they're really good to us and um, they really support, they genuinely support um, innovative young brands. Um, and it's a great, it's a great place to, um, launch food products because it's, it's this less tough than the big multiples and you can make changes quite easily um so so it's it's good to kind of you know put a project out see you know, get real um feedback real sales data make some sweet uh, make some sweets <laughs> make some tweaks and um and you know and gradually improve the product to get to the point where you know, for example, at the moment, our price point is eight ninety nine, 
and I've worked really, really hard to, um, to lower our cost of peanut without yes. compromising. And that's been, that has been purely by reducing our packaging costs. We haven't altered the ingredients at all, or the quality of the ingredients. We've just um, reduced our packaging costs. Which is amazing, isn't it? <sighs> yeah. Um, so we're in the process of, um, we're going to be shortly reducing our retail price and that will really help us get into um, supermarkets. Yeah. But we've managed to do that because Acardo customers prepare to pay a higher price. So we can, we've created a premium product that was kind of, we had all saving all dancing packaging. You know, people bought it, they liked it. We were then like, right, you know, to get to the next step, we need to lower the price. Of course. How are we going to do that? Improve the packaging and just make it more economical. So we do that. Um, you know, then because the price has gone down, sales have gone up and then, um, you know, and then we kind of gradually make it to multiples who really demand a competitive price. Yes, and that's the difficult, that's the more difficult market. And so at the minute, everything is online, which is really, really Yeah, everything's yeah. online, yeah. So with our packaging, um, so this, this change came about because our packaging suppliers became so difficult. Um, and it was really a blessing in disguise. So originally we had our little bottle, our custom bottle, in a what's called a blister pack. So it's a plastic cup that is wedged between two pieces of cardboard and that sits in what is called a shelf ready box. So it stands upright on a shelf and that's what most sweeteners come in. And um, because most of our sales, 99% of our sales are online, it was ridiculous having this um, blister pack that looks lovely but isn't practical for online. And especially with Amazon, that really manhandles products. The, the uh, backing cards, the, the card bit was getting um, really beaten up. So uh, we cre created a new little, it just comes in a little box, in a little box um, that's really, really simple and easy to produce and affordable to produce and much better for the, for the environment as well. So the little box I'm really, really happy with. Um, I think we might make some design tweaks for, the, for our next production. But as I say, it's about a third of the price, and that um, that move is what is going to allow us to reduce our retail price. Which is amazing, and yeah. it's amazing just, as you say, thinking about the market in a different way, knowing that I, this is an online market. Actually, my product's arriving, and it probably doesn't look great because it's been squished and bashed yeah, and exactly. bent. Actually making that small change has allowed you to be able to even have a you know, a bigger impact on your customers because you can actually lower the price and give them the product for a cheaper price, which yeah. is amazing. And what, what I don't think people, especially consumers, don't realise, so say if you've got an item that retails for £10, right, that doesn't have that to, for, for uh, simplicity's sake. So um, say if you've got a product that retails for £10 and these aren't the margins that exist, um, you know, all the way through, and they're not our margins, but as an example, £10 retail price, so Tesco's, say, is buying that for five pounds and you're making that for two pounds fifty. So we're, we're assuming that everyone's making 50% margin, which will not be true. But in that situation, um, if you reduce your costs from two pound, from two pounds fifty to two pounds, so you're, you're um, reducing your cost per unit by 50p, that means Tesco's can buy it for four pounds and you still maintain a 50% margin, and then the consumer is buying it then for eight pounds, and Tesco's maintaining their 50% margin. So if in that singular situation, isolated situation, for every 50p you shave off your cost per unit, the consumer is shaving two pounds. That's amazing, isn't and it? And consumers won't necessarily, so a 1p saving, and that can be from increased volumes, or, you know, um, as I say, mainly savings to be made in packaging, that, um, it's shop around. Yeah. That's what I could say, shop around in terms of packaging. Um, but yes, if every penny that you shave off a cost per unit is saving the end customer four pence in that in that scenario, situation, of that course, scenario. which is amazing. And it's great to be able to pass those savings on to customers yeah. because you know customers value the fact that you're trying to make your price more affordable for them, but they're still getting the same quality product. Yeah, it's but you know, if, if that's if, you know, that's if that anyway it's an <laughs> ideal world in an ideal situation uh, not all businesses will necessarily pass those uh, uh, those uh, those savings on i understand yes. that but you know it's, it's all very interesting there's a lot of different um food diets 
ways people are eating, things people are cutting out now yeah. in the media, you know, people are going for veganism or pescatarian or paleo diet or all of those different things. Have you found that that's affected your customer base? Um, yes and no. What I would say is it's very difficult for us to, um, to know exactly um, what our customers are following because, um, for example, with Ocado, we get weekly sales data, but we don't get a breakdown of who's bought it. Of course. I mean, we could probably um, wangle a way to get more conclusive data in terms of breakdown between men and women or age or um, uh, you know, economic background. We could probably get that information, um, but but you know we don't get that information, so it's, it is actually quite difficult to know. Um, and even on Amazon, we get, um, I think we get part of someone's address and their name, so it's very easy to see what gender they are and whereabouts in the UK they live, but we don't get information beyond that. So it's, I actually, to be honest, I can't say conclusively. I don't think, um, I know veganism is very trendy. I don't think that has had a real impact on our sales. Um, because actually within the vegan uh, vegan lifestyle, they eat a lot of fructose yeah. because those fruit sugars are allowed, uh, one, of the, one of the few things that are. So um, if I were vegan, I'm not, but if I were, I wouldn't want to cut out an additional of course, food group that, that, you're actually, you that, you're that you're allowed yes. because actually then you're like, well, are you gonna get enough calories if you cut out sugars and meat and dairy and, and, yeah. and. Um, so I don't think veganism has had um, an impact on our sales. I, I do know that some of our customers are paleo, I follow paleo lifestyle, um, and stevia is, um, you know, is talked about in the paleo sphere. Um, but I think I think the main thing that's driving our sales is just the awareness of sugar and also the awareness around sugar alternatives. And the word sugar, oh, the phrase, I should say, because it's not just one word, the phrase sugar alternative annoys me a little bit because, um, so for example, coconut sugar is a sugar alternative. But is it? Because it's sugar. Exactly. Honey yes. is a sugar alternative, but it's sugar. Um, you, you know, fructose, a lot of uh, fructose has started, I've noticed a lot of um, light soft drinks, upmarket light soft drinks are using fructose instead of sugar. But it's sugar, and that, and and um, and actually, I, what I would say with paleo is that a lot of paleo people don't eat fructose, and they will use stevia instead. So I would say, out of all, excuse me, out of all the um, lifestyles, I would say paleo is probably one of the ones that um, would be one of the lifestyles that would go to to yes. stevia as a sweetening option. Um, so yeah, the word sugar alternative kind of annoys me and I think it's really misused. Um, mm, but maybe there needs to be more education around that. Do you know what? They need to create a different name for sugar in, um, that is naturally occurring in foods and sugar, and cane sugar. So because I would refer to table sugar as cane sugar and then the word sugar, I would just assume. Any other naturally any occurring other, sugar. And all sugar is natural. There's no such thing as artificial sugar. Yes, of course. And again, as you say, it's back to that idea of education and being aware of the different alternatives. But it's and a very confusing topic. Yes. You know, it's a very, <laughs> like, I mean, it's a really confusing topic. And, um, you know, I'd, I mean, I, I really wish there was more education, more um, healthy eating education, not even healthy eating, there's information given in schools yeah. about, you know, what is a protein? What is a carbohydrate? What is a fat? What is a sugar? What, where does sugar come from? What's it in? Um, you know, how, how to cook? You know, I really think, I really, really think there needs to be more done there because um, I don't think it's really fair then to get angry when people aren't making the right food choices. Like, well, you haven't given them all the information that they need. And as you say, it's not even the, what is the carbohydrate? What is the protein? It's actually putting that in context as in, you know, when you are cooking, this is what it looks like. That's too much sugar to be eating within a day. Looking at daily records and actually putting that in context in real life scenarios, so that people are really understanding it on the ground. And as you say, education is so important because, you know, you go through school and you don't have that, maybe that information. And then as you say, it's very difficult for people to make the right decisions because they're not making informed choices. Yeah, and do you know what? I was at my sister's baby shower um, a, few, uh, a month ago and um, 
So everyone there has been very fortunate, all the women there were really fortunate that they were all well educated, they'd all gone to university, and I'm pretty sure everyone there knew how to cook. So we sat down to this really lovely home cooked meal that was, um, you know, they had, there was so many options, coronation chicken, salads, um, you know, new potatoes, lovely vegetables. So it was a really decadent meal, but it was all really healthy and prepared from scratch. And after the meal, I was like looking around, I was like, look, not one woman here is overweight. And a lot of those girls had already had children. And um, you know, I was the youngest person there. And you're like, flip, you know, statistically speaking, like 60 plus people, 60% of the people here, so you know, there were, I think, you know, what, 20 girls there, so what, 12 people should have been yes. at least overweight, if not obese, and not one girl was. That's interesting. You know, and it? I just thought, flip, just because I, I, I find, I really like sort of looking and observing people's behaviours and what they're doing and how they're eating, and um, I find that really interesting, um, just because, you know, it's obesity, you know, and diabetes and is such a big problem and it just I was like flip you know actually this is actually really unusual but we didn't think anything of it you know no I was the only person being like flip you know this is a part technically a party but it's been really well prepared you know the dips were all things like hummus and um you know uh, uh, vegetables with hummus and yeah. things and olives and so it was a lovely lovely event and we all had great fun but it was very healthy and that's because we can all cook yeah. Um, you know, lots of, all the different girls brought something different. Um, and back to that, maybe just even, it's life skills really, isn't it? It's, it's you know, skills, how to yeah. cook a healthy meal that's not a convenience food that you just shove in the oven. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. And I think people are becoming more aware, more conscious and more thoughtful about the whole process and where they're sourcing their food from and, and how to prepare it. And yeah, but I, I think definitely people are becoming more conscious, but I think more needs to be done in school to prepare yeah. children of how to actually live. Because yeah. do you know what? I can't remember any of my geography, right? I can't remember any of it. I don't even know all the cities in the UK, right? It hasn't affected my life one bit. <laughs> but I am so thankful that I can cook because it has, if I couldn't cook, my life might be very different. It might have been much more difficult for me to recover from IBS and pre-diabetes. Um, you know, I might not have done that. Yeah. I might not have been able to recover from that had I not been able to cook. So you're like, we need to, I mean, I'm not saying we should ditch geography, I'm not saying that, but I think we really, there needs to be a, a, a clinical look at um, children's curriculum. Yeah, and actually showing them how to make tasty food with healthy ingredients, that it doesn't have to be laden with sugar and it yeah. doesn't need to be laden with salt and it, you know, you don't need all that to make but, something healthy and tasty. You know, an hour every other week yes. throughout a child's 10 year yeah. Um, school, you know, if they go up, if they continue with A levels, um, I don't think that's too much to ask. And children actually really enjoy they cooking. Enjoy it. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I used to when I years ago when I used to teach. I mean, we did a cookery class after school, and it, it was always oversubscribed because the kids wanted to come, and we didn't. We did the odd sweet thing, but we did things like wraps and salads and yeah. you know fajitas and things and. They loved all of that and cutting the ingredients and making it and tasting it and bringing it home. And then they were edgy. They were bringing it home to their parents who were then making it and, re, you know, creating yeah. it at home, which was lovely. Yeah, I think I think that's... I, I really think focusing on the education point of view is going to have the biggest difference. Yeah, which is really interesting. So what does the future hold for modern what does nature? The future hold? Um, lots more products coming, lots more products. I think um, for us, the key to expanding is to is to create more products and to get them down to a competitive price point. And, um, and yeah, and uh, we, we are looking at kind of expanding outside the UK, particularly online, because that's, that's not yes. too difficult to do. So um, lots more products, I'm trying to get new customers and, and expand where our products are stocked. That's so just keeping you keeping you busy and out of trouble. <laughs> and, if, <laughs> yes. and Bessie, if anyone wants to um, try out your products, where's mm -hmm. the best place? You mentioned that Oka. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're in the mainland, then Ocado. Um, if you shop on Ocado, then you can get it on Ocado, no problem. Um, Amazon is probably the easiest place for, for everyone. We do have our own eBay store, so that's us shipping it ourselves on mm -hmm. eBay. And then we do have our website as well, which I think will be... Yes, here. <laughs> um, so yes. So everyone needs to try um, some sugar-free alternatives. 
be that little bit healthier. And as you say, it's not about replacing all the sugar in your diet, it's just reducing and, yeah. and making that a conscious little change. But thank you so much, it's been so interesting. It's been a um, to be here. And all those alternatives that are out there, it's amazing just to be educated in, in what's happening and the whole products and the, and the process. <laughs> um, so there'll be lots of information for lots of people that are starting up. And um, so that's all from us today at Profile Tree TV, the content marketing agency, and thank you for watching. Thank you.